Well, good morning. We want to welcome you to First Baptist Church here of Lloyd. And uh, I was almost tempted to just pause at the doors there and wait and see, uh, see who would start to notice the time and f see if anybody would jump up here and take my place. But I wasn't going to do that. Well, welcome. As you can see, the stage is still set up from VBS. We had a great VBS this week. Hopefully, we're going to have some kiddos in the audience to come up and sing in a few minutes and uh, share the, one of the songs they learned this week. But June, there is more stuff in June. So if you take your calendar real quickly, uh, we do have Lyft uh, tomorrow evening, the Ladies in Faith Together uh, Bible study at 6 p.m. Uh, Crafty Ladies will kick back in on uh, Thursday at 9 a.m. So come and they'll start working on more crafts for the summer and stuff now that VBS is over. Looks like we have the WW Diners on Thursday. So I check in with Mary Helen on that to find out where they're going and if they're taking the bus this Thursday or not or just meeting at the restaurant. Watermelon Festival, that's always a big thing here in Monticello. Uh, my wife got me this shirt to sort of represent Watermelon Festival this year. So uh, let's see if you can tell the watermelons from the other things on the shirt. But uh, check in with uh, Chris and the youth to see what they need for the Watermelon Festival. They always need some help, but there's some some strict rules this year about when they can set up and when they have to be there. So if you're a parent of a youth or a youth being involved in that, make sure you get your walking orders from Chris on that. Uh, don't forget, families, Father's Day is next Sunday, so make sure you're ready for Father's Day, however you honor them. Uh, Wednesday, Wednesday we'll start our normal routine on Wednesdays again, so please sign up in the lobby for the meals. Uh, and we are still looking for a few more people to finish out the schedule for uh, the summer and into the fall, so check with Miss Betty on uh, getting scheduled for a meal. Um, next Wednesday, Huxley is going to be sharing his mission experience, so you'll want to come and, and celebrate that. And then in, let me count it right, one, two. In two weeks, we will have an evening concert. Uh, we have Daryl and Dina. Don't have a last name on the calendar here, but they're, they're coming at 6 p.m. to present us a concert. And so, again, uh, uh, make sure you, you uh, spread the word, bring some friends and family to that if you've got people visiting and stuff. So that finishes off June. I'm sure July will have some events, but summer, sometimes we, we, we try to take it a little bit easier with the events, but they just keep coming. So uh, you, we'll, we'll head into that. So let's uh, stop and pray this morning and get centered on Jesus and the gospel. We had a great uh, a time in Romans. We made it through three verses, which uh, seems like uh, we're going slow, but it's worth it, talking about the gospel. So let's, let's pray this morning. Father God, we thank you. We praise you. We ask that you glorify your name. And Lord, as we take the time to share the gospel with people, we know you will honor that, Father God. It is the, as we saw in Romans 1, 16, it is the power of God. The gospel is the power of God in salvation for all who believe. We thank you for that promise. We thank you for that, that, that power that we have because of the gospel. And so, Lord, let us not ever stop talking about it. We thank you. We praise you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Did you hear that? The bus will leave Thursday at 530 from here if you're going to dinner. Thank you, Eric. Okay, good morning, good morning. Let's all stand. I know we got a few tired people in the audience because we did have a nice week at VBS, but it does get a little tiring, so we can get a little bit more energy out of you for just the next hour. Then you can go home and rest and say VBS is over. But the children were wonderful, lives were blessed. I know my life was blessed just being here, watching the kids learn about Jesus, and I'm sure everybody else's was too. We're going to start this morning with Battle Belongs. When all I see is the mountain 
and every fear I lay at your feet. I'll sing through the night, oh God, the battle belongs to you. And if you are for me, who can So if you have a battle this morning, just turn it over to God and he will definitely fight that battle for you. Our scripture comes from Psalms 57, 7, and it says, My heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast, and I will sing and give praises.
in for a real treat so we're going to ask all of our VBS kids that are here this morning to come on up front and they're all like uh but come on for up front and we're going to do one of our songs from VBS
Well, they did really well. But I must admit, I wonder if that's what Cindy looks at, our audience. <laughs> Every time she claps her hands, I, I wonder how many of us, anyway, having said that. It really was a good week. It really was fantastic. In fact, a big thanks to John, all the volunteers that helped and parents that brought their kids. Um, I made the comment, I had the youth group this week. I think Chris paid them. They were excellent. I mean, they were phenomenal. They only fell asleep like two, three times the whole week. It was amazing to go. They did great. And um, we had a, a project yesterday on the hills of VBS. All the workers that came, thank you so much. This place looks wonderful. I can't go on and on. And so allow me to catch everybody up. This was a great mission week. But now we've got to look forward to what the Bible says about 1 Corinthians 13. Here's the deal. I want to say thank you to all those who have shared their heart over the last several weeks about what the Scriptures mean to them and what the sermons have meant to them. I appreciate that. My goal is to wrap this chapter up today. It'll be no less than a Father's Day miracle as we go through. So here's the deal. Let me start with this. With Father's Day coming up, I've reserved the right to tell my one bad joke. It's bad. I'm just going ahead and set expectations. The deal is this, whenever it gets asked, Pastor, can you please explain eternity to me? My answer will always be the same. I could, but it'll take forever. Thank you very much, everybody. It only gets better from here. You see, here's the deal that we've got that out of the way. The other day I'm reading this article by Thomas Beavers and it said this. It said, eternity is difficult, if not impossible, to illustrate. You see, here's the deal. Time and time again, I've heard preachers, including myself, try to relate how long eternity will be. In other words, we'll say something like, you know, this problem you're in or this situation you're in, it's only going to be like one second in all of eternity. You see, the interesting thing that's been uh, lying on my heart about this is the problem is that when you try to use time to illustrate eternity, it, you need to know that eternity transcends time. It's like saying to somebody when you're trying to talk about eternity that I can hear the concern on your face. Or it's like saying I can see the trembling in your voice. It doesn't make any sense. The situation is, eternity can't really be measured in time. It can't even be illustrated in time. It's always going to be outside of that. And see, God, when we think of seconds, minutes, hours, days, weeks, He doesn't even think in those terms. When He says He loves you for a lifetime, He doesn't mean 72 years for men, a little bit longer for ladies. He loves you forever. And so this week I overheard one of our youth saying they needed to kill time. And I couldn't help but think of that for a while because so many adults have said this over their lifetime. But I can't think of what, it, help but think of what Henry David Thoreau said. He said, as if you could kill time without injuring eternity. Today, I thought I'd try to paint you a picture instead of eternity. You see one lovely moonlit, I've used this illustration before, a night this grandfather and his small granddaughter went for a walk. The stars were magnificent. And as the grandfather named the individual stars and constellations, the granddaughter explained, Grandpa, if the bottom side of heaven is this beautiful, just think how wonderful the top will be. Ladies and gentlemen, in order to understand love, you're probably wondering, why is he talking about eternity? I promise you, if you'll stay with me, it'll all make sense as it unfolds. Would you pray with me as we get started? Lord, we love you, and we cannot thank you enough for all that you have done for us. There are some in our faith family today that are hurting, Lord. They need healing of their bodies. They need wisdom. They're about to make a thousand decisions all in the span of minutes. But Father, more than anything, would you give us your peace? As we read these scriptures, change our life from the inside out. This was my request. And I ask that in the name of Jesus. Amen. By now, many of you have understood the problems in the early church at Corinth. It really it symbolizes some of the things we go through now. In case you're new, I'll just explain very quickly. We have so many things in common. There was a 
abuse in the gifts of tongues. There's division, division in the church. There's complaining over the gifts and there's selfishness and envy. There was lawsuits and there was sin done that was so bad that Paul even said the Gentiles wouldn't have done it. All of that still unfolds in our churches today. And many of you would say the reason they behave this way is because they don't have the love that 1 Corinthians is talking about. Well, if they love Jesus, they wouldn't act like that. And so I need to point out what the Bible says, that when you ask Jesus to forgive you and become your Lord, He fills your heart with the love that He creates. And this chapter is referring to what is called this agape love. It is God's love that He gave us in His Spirit. Now, for the record, 1 John 3, 1 says that the moment you'll get saved, the love of God takes root in your home. And that home is here. And it says, behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. What is that love? That we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know Him. And then in 1 John 4, 16, it follows and says, we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. The moment you get saved, the love of God is given to you. And so something I get asked in different ways and different measures is people always say something to the effect that that person who claims to know Jesus but lives as if he doesn't exist. People ask, does that mean that the love of God has failed somehow? I mean, they said they believe. But they act like a heathen. What does that mean in life? Well, Paul answers in 1 Corinthians 13, 8. This is his answer to the comment. Has God ever let us down? Has he ever failed us? Here's the answer. Love never fails. Love never fails. But whether prophecies, they'll fail. Whether there's tongues, they'll cease. Whether there's knowledge, it'll vanish away. For we in part... For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, and when that which is perfect has come, that which is in part will be done away. Ladies and gentlemen, in case you're new today, uh, for those of you who are just tuning in, I want to tell you today's sermon's a little heady. Here's what I mean by a little heady. You ready? That means all the hair of my head has gone bye-bye. Actually, that's not what that means. What that means is... I would like to take you a little bit deeper. So for those of you who are note takers, you're going right. Unfortunately, I don't have some things on the board, but stay with me. Here's what these scriptures unfold. In other words, I'd love to give you the whole picture, but I can't. I'd like to give you the whole thing of your life. Can't do it. And many of you would say, well, I want to know what's going to happen this week, next year. I would like to even know when I die. Not me. In prophecy... And knowledge and tongues were not permanent gifts. These were not eternal gifts that were promised. In fact, these three gifts all have a time and a place in God's kingdom. And so very quickly, you need to know that these three gifts, which is called knowledge, prophecy, tongues, all work together. Knowledge doesn't just mean education, but rather where the Spirit of God has given you a message. And so God would give knowledge to the prophet, and then the prophet would give this message in a tongue. It's speaking out loud for those to hear. An interpreter was often used. Sometimes even the prophet himself, like the Old Testament, would explain this message. There were gifts that early church loved. These were flashy gifts. People in the church today, they love these kinds of gifts. Because you could go to somebody and say, I'm looking into your life and I perceive that you're going to eat lunch. And then when you eat lunch, they go, ooh, God must be real. They would say flashy things like, I perceive that you're tired. Who isn't? And so these weren't prophetic things that were there. Prophetic things were life-altering things where God's trying to get your attention and people like the flashy things like tongues. But Paul tells us that these gifts will fail. A better word is called abolished or cease. But love, however, love is different. I hope by now that you're starting to learn what makes love so different. But what you need to know is that you can have all the gifts that Paul talked about. He named five spiritual ones in this chapter. Tongues, prophecy, knowledge, faith, giving as in service. And he pointed out that without love, though, these gifts are nothing. You can do all kinds of stuff. 
You can have the faith that can move a mountain, but if it's done without love, all you did was wreck somebody's lakefront slash mountain lodging. You get the point, don't you? And so here's the deal, is that when you're tested, you can have all these kinds of gifts, but Paul says, without love, you will not profit. And so then Paul starts describing what love is, and in verse 4, he says, love suffers long, it's kind. Love does not envy, it does not parade itself. It's not puffed up. It does not behave rudely. It does not seek his own. It's not provoked, thinks no evil. It does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth. It bears all things, it believes all things, it hopes all things, it endures all things. Love will endure forever. Listen to that again. God's love lasts forever. And now you know why we're about to talk about eternity. You see, God is love. Which means in order to understand the love of God, you need to realize that we ought to have eternity on our minds at all times. Why? Because God's love never fails. This is a message of love this morning. But the gift that God gives to every believer is both eternity with Him and the love that never fails. So let me encourage you to live with eternity on your mind, on your heart. Because the Bible points out to each and every one of us that living with eternity in our mind, it's actually the wisest part of our lives to live. You see, I was looking for resources that I could somehow put across to each and every one of you. And I found this website that I've used several times before. I've mentioned it to each and every one of you. It's called this website called Got Questions. And what was asked was, how do you live with an eternal perspective? And I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, it's this article that summed up everything I wanted to express. You see, church, an internal perspective keeps us from chasing empty dreams and material satisfaction like gifts that will fade in time. You know, when I was 18, I I used to consider myself a a strong, energetic fellow. But you know what I've learned as I got older and spending a week with youth? I'm an old man. They just can go and go and go. And like those gifts, boy, those things in my life begin to fade. You know, I look at life amongst all of us. And living with eternity on my mind keeps me from killing time. It keeps me from wasting years pursuing temporary things that I can't take with me when I die. You see, I'm going to show you how to put eternity on your mind. The love of God that never ever will fail. It says this, first of all, you need to make sure that you're certain that you're saved. That you're born again. See, eternity awaits for all of us. There's only two destinations, by the way. There's not three. There's no such thing as purgatory. So here's the illustration. You're either going to hell or you're going to heaven, but you can't do both. When you die, the Bible says the absent from the body is at present with the Lord, which means that when you part, you're going somewhere. But the only way to make sure that you're spending eternity in heaven with our Heavenly Father is to be born again. This brand new birth It results in a brand new spirit. And when God gives you His Spirit, love enters in. And so when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior into our hearts, our minds, He rearranges our life. It means that we have believed in our heart that He died for us, was buried for us, and came back to life for us. And right now, He's building a place for us. How beautiful the top of heaven must be. It's at that point that we begin to gain an eternal perspective active and we begin to realize that the love of god never ever fails now in order to understand that not only are you saved but in order to understand an eternal perspective you need to be filled with the holy spirit when you accept jesus christ you receive the holy spirit immediately but to be filled means that he does a continued work in our lives the decision has to be made by you Just how much am I going to yield my life to the Holy Spirit? How much am I actually going to surrender to His will instead of my own? See, the Holy Spirit will never push you to be obedient. He won't make you. You're not a robot. 
And so because of that, if you choose to hinder or hurt the Spirit of God, then He's not going to give you the gifts you need in order to serve Him. And I would ask you, why would you look forward to going to heaven when you don't want to do what He wants now? You see, eternity is a gift from God. And we ought to be preparing our entire lives in the future now. When we're filled with the Spirit, we are totally surrendered to Him. He takes control of us. So if you want an eternal perspective and realize that you need to live in His will, in His will alone. Galatians 5.16 even mentions that if you walk by the Spirit, you won't gratify the lusts of the flesh. Jesus said you can't serve two masters, so which one is it going to be? Now, as you grow in your faith, as you develop and maintain an eternal perspective, you need to start storing up treasures in heaven. The treasures that we will actually store in heaven will last for an eternity, and they are done so here on earth. Jesus said, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Which means that if your treasures and all your stuff, that's where you're going to stay. Now, don't get me wrong, we're called to be good stewards of what God gave us, and none of us should just take for granted all of God's gifts. But understand that if your life is altered significantly by the loss of one item in your house, I would argue that that was your treasure. There are all kinds of things you can do to store up treasures. But you just learned, in case it's new info, that stuff on earth isn't any of those. But the treasures the Bible is speaking of are given from having done the Father's will. You can donate time to the church, schools. You can donate money. You can help other Christian organizations. You can give your talents and abilities for the causes of Christ. The list goes on and on about the things you can do for Him. And Matthew 10 even says that offering a cup of cold water to a servant of the Lord is a cause for reward. So instead of thinking of your needs and what you want to be happy, an eternal perspective is full of the love of God. It's one that shifted all these earthly concerns to heavenly things. I know you've probably heard in the past, don't be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. Most of all of you have heard that at some point. Well, let me flip that around. You ready? I think we all need to be so heavenly minded that we become earthly good. You see, as you grow in your faith, you can develop and maintain this eternal perspective. And it doesn't have to be a roller coaster. What you do is you start spending time with God and in His Word. I heard it said that you would not expect a car to go a thousand miles on a single tank of gas. I'd like that. That'd be great. But my car doesn't work that way. But yet it seems that some people think that if they say a quick prayer or read a quick devotional, that that's enough to give them enough of Jesus for weeks and months. But just like a car needs tank, they're, they're tank full, our life, our spiritual tank needs to be filled completely and at all times with Jesus Christ. John Frizzell, as you no doubt heard earlier, he's teaching out of the book of Romans. And in this Sunday school, eventually he'll get to the part of Romans 12, 1 and 2 about the renewing of one's mind. Which means that spending time in the presence of God invites him to take control and to reveal in all our lives the areas that are not under his control. You see, sometimes we're stubborn people. Sometimes we like to have little boxes in our life that that's my area. God, I'll give you yours, but this one's mine. See, you think if you have an internal mindset, you'd want him to take control over every area of your life. And if that's your mindset, you have to pray. You have to read his word. Then you acknowledge and you confess the love of God. God, I need your love to take over. I need your love to direct me. I need your love to help me understand what to say and do next. It's a continual washing of the word, Ephesians 5 says. But see, as you grow in your faith, there's one more point that I'd like to bring out on how to maintain an eternal perspective. 
is I need to begin to stay conscious to the fact that this world is not all there is. Ladies and gentlemen, this is not as good as it gets. And so because of that, I think it's easy to lose ourselves in the daily concerns of life. When I was a younger man, I never thought about my health much. As I get older, do you know what everybody keeps constantly saying? Hey, how's your retirement plan? How's your medical? You got dental, vision? You know, when I was 18 years old, I knew I had eyes as long as they worked. Never occurred to me that my my life might get worse as I get older. But here's the nuance of things. is those who live with an eternal perspective, they're equally aware that every day matters and every day counts. For any of you who have lost loved ones in the last years, any of you who are struggling with family and friends even right now, and you've watched them as they somehow struggle day in and day out, many of you have begun to understand how important the quality of, Of one's life is. As opposed to the uh, quantity. 2 Corinthians 4. 17 and 18 says. That for our light and momentary troubles. Are achieving for us. Eternal glory. That far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes. On not what is seen. But what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary. But what is unseen. Is eternal. Our lives struggle. And I know that some of you are going through such terrible things moment by moment. But I want you to hear this word of encouragement. That believe it or not, it's a very temporary problem. And soon, whether that's five minutes or another 500 years, I couldn't tell you. But soon, those temporary problems are changed to eternal glory. And so what occurs is we've got to intentionally redirect our thoughts to what is eternal. We need to weigh everything against what Christ went through and what He's gone through for us daily. You see, since we've been raised in Christ, Colossians says, that we ought to set our hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God, setting your minds on what's above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden in Christ. Where's your mind today? Because if you go to each and every person and you say, I love you and I care about you and I want what is best for you. But if you don't want God's will, which is best in their life, what is it that you do want? We wish you good help. I hope all your bills are paid this month. But none of that matters if they're going to hell. You see, none of that matters if they're not doing God's will. And so what occurs in this time frame is you have to decide, what does my life mean? What is it about? And if it's about the love of God, then we need to begin thinking with this eternal mindset. God has commanded us to live with eternal perspective. We have to work at it. So when things aren't going smoothly, instead of blaming everything in the world on the world, we need to focus on Christ instead. Let your mind think about what's going to come instead of the troubles. Some of us can't see the light at the end of the tunnel because all we're looking at is the tunnel. But if you start looking for the light, if you start living for the light, you find the light. The other night, we lost power. If you live in Lloyd, Florida... You're going to lose power. So here it is, middle of the night. I'm stumbling around like I haven't lived there for the, over the last five years. And I'm wanting to figure out how things go. And I'm looking for all these lights. And I flick switches like we hadn't been without power for 20 minutes. Nothing works. You see where I'm going with this, don't you, ladies and gentlemen? I had to find the light. We keep a flashlight next to my side of the bed thanks to my children and the gifts they give. And I click this light. Incidentally, I want to share this little momentary light affliction. I had the flashlight upside down. So after I saw the light and all the stars that surrounded it, I flipped it around. I pointed out where I needed to go. And then sure enough, I just followed the light and it got me right where I needed to be. You see, some of you 
have spent so much time running away from God that it's like the moment you actually do see the light, of course it blinds you. Of course it got your attention. You don't know what to do, so just flip it around. Let the light lead you. And you follow that light, but that's maintaining that eternal perspective. God, I'm going through the worst, but one day when I'm in heaven with you, it's going to be amazing. No more problems. No more sorrows. You see, we need to begin asking, praying. Lord, teach us during these hard times to follow you closer. Ask yourselves, if it matters to Jesus, shouldn't it matter to you? He's going to help you actually know the difference. You see, if holding an eternal perspective came naturally, He wouldn't have commanded you to do it. But we have to choose to continually set our minds on things above. And as you develop the habit of thinking eternally, what happens to our lives is we begin to show others what it means to walk in Christ. And what we really hope is that somebody will come along and go, how can I gain an eternal perspective too? I mean, how can my mind, how can my life change? Well, in 1 Corinthians 13, 11, this is what Paul says. He says, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I'm also known. Now abide faith, hope, love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. Well, we did it. This chapter is coming to a close. Y'all ready? Now we got to take off. We got one spirit. We don't have multiples. Incidentally, I think it's interesting. My mom had disassociative personality disorder. What that means is a fancy way of saying she had multiple personalities. So when I was growing up, sometimes I never knew who I was talking with. But I've got great news for you. She only had one spirit. She only had one God. And through that experience of life, what you need to know is that the greatest gift He's ever given is love. And so when you show others how to live with eternity on your mind, you show them the growth that you've experienced in the Lord. And you show the love of God in your life. And so a Christian is called to grow in Christ. You're called to mature in your faith. But what we've discovered about this book in Corinthians, about our modern churches today, is like many Christians growing up, they're like children playing with toys that are one day going to disappear. You ever tried to take a toy, a toy away from a child and their reaction? Or if that didn't work, try to take your keys from your teenager. See how that unfolds. Or better yet, Try these older retired people who don't need to be driving anymore. Try to take away their keys. See how that goes. But you see, what unfolds in Scripture is this isn't thinking like someone with an eternal perspective. This is someone who is dreaming constantly of material satisfaction or like temporary spiritual gifts. These people who think they have all the time in the world with no thoughts of wasting years, they spend their lives pursuing temporary things that we can't take with us when we die. Let's talk about suicide very quickly. That is someone who has taken a temporary problem and applied a permanent solution. See, don't you understand? Our lives are supposed to be lived in such a way that when others look at us, they want to know what's different. They want to know what is going on in your life. And so you can reply back to them. You know, when I was a kid, I thought just like a kid. When I was a babe in Christ, I thought just like a babe in Christ. But when I got older... I began to put away some of those childish things. When I got older, I decided that maturity in my faith and in my devotion meant more to me than that childish thing I had as a kid. I like memory lane. Sometimes I like it when people unfold a box and they go through and they're like, do you remember this when I was a kid? you remember this? 
There's nothing wrong with going back to a memory lane. But there's a problem when they open up that box and they spend the next 20 years playing with that little thing they used to play with 20 years ago. Ladies and gentlemen, the same is said in our scriptures. If you're still reading the same four scriptures every day of your life, You're missing the meat of the word. You're missing the meal of the word. You're missing the fulfillment of all that God is. Please, I'm challenging you. I'm begging you, if nothing else, that when you go home this day and you open up God's word, start at some point at the beginning of a book. You don't have to read Genesis 1 through 3 all the time of your life. And then when 4 hits, you go, well, that was good. If you start reading Revelation and you have questions, you come talk to people. You start examining things. Start tearing things apart in a good way. Ask God to challenge you. Why? Because you expect a child to think and understand and speak like a child. But I expect a child to grow up, don't you? I've made many a comment about my boys. I love my children. Love them to death. Can't wait for them to move out. But why do I say that? It's nothing bad on them. I want to see what God does in their life. I want to see all the prayers that we have prayed collective over these new graduates that just graduated. Either kindergarten, fifth grade I'm learning is really important, right? Eighth grade, high school, college, doesn't matter. I want to see all the prayers and all the moments that we have poured into all these children, students, and now grown adults. As to see what's going to happen in their life. But it's the same thing in you. I want to see about those people who are about to be retired. I wonder what's going to happen when they retire. You retired folks. How is that devoted life? Or are you still a babe in Christ? Have you heard more sermons than I've ever delivered? But where are you? In your faith. You see... There comes a day where we need to put away childish things. And so for those this morning who are wanting to have that eternal perspective, God's love in their life, you've got to grow in your faith. So listen up. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says that He's made everything beautiful in His time. And He's put eternity in their hearts. Except that no man can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. And I don't know some of you Christians out there. You have family, friends. They've lost their heart. Rather, they've lost their walk with Christ because they don't see what God is doing in their life or in the lives of people they love and care about. And this morning, I don't want you to lose heart. See, just like this scripture in Ecclesiastes, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians that our lives are created by God and that our hearts, we can experience all of eternity, but we won't see everything yet. You see, Paul says at the moment, our knowledge, it's partial, it's incomplete. Even the gift of prophecy, it'll only reveal what is just part of the picture. So in New Testament, what it says at that time in Corinthians, it was a book that wasn't completed. Now for us, it's fully completed. But we aren't given full understanding. We are, however, given a full revelation. Any of you who have ever spent any time reading the book of Revelation... You know how it turns out. You ready? Revelation in 10 seconds. Jesus comes back. Satan's taken care of. And we're with him forever. Did you like that? That was the Cliff Notes version. Why do I know that? Because I read it. How about you? Now, I realize that was extremely elementary. We'll go into much greater detail later on. But stay with me. Our understanding of Scripture, for many people, if we were really honest we would say "Eh, it's partial at best. So now you must see why you need to grow in knowledge and in faith. We must mature. We must put away childish things. That goes for our entire church, is that we ought to, as a church, mature in the process of our faith. I love our VBS songs. But could you imagine if that was how we worshipped every single Sunday? Would you be on stage and hold your hands just like this? And then do like that? That would be about it, wouldn't it? Some of y'all still clap like that, don't you? But understand, we grow and we develop. But Paul said, now we see in a mirror dim. 
But that's Paul's figure of speech by saying we have imperfect knowledge. We have imperfect understanding. But this actually won't always be the case. Paul is telling each and every one of us that what we know now, it's kind of partial. It's incomplete only because we don't understand it all yet. But then one day we're going to know everything completely just as God knows you completely. When Jen and I were dating, we were virgins before we were born. I just wanted to see if y'all are paying attention. We were virgins before we got married. And, and we used to joke about knowing one another. Like, I could, I could finish your sentences. And she used to tease me and back and forth and all these things. And we only knew each other up to a certain point. But we knew each other. We were engaged for Pete's sake. And so then we stand before God and our preachers. Stand before a whole congregation in life. And then what happens? Got married. And then over the last almost 23 years, we've spent time getting to know one another. You see, I think I know God pretty well. I bet you do too. But it's nothing like after we go into heaven and we sit down at the wedding feast where we see Jesus face to face and then we'll really know him. Now, God made you. He knows you. But every day you grow in Christ, He reveals a little bit more and more about Him. That's why we have a living God and we read what is called a living word. All of you in this room at some point can say, you know, I read that scripture like 30 times. But when I read it the 31st time, it was like a light bulb went off. I just learned something brand new. It was amazing. You know why? Because God, step by step, He will reveal things to you. So before you lose heart and you get a little disappointed this morning, going, you know, I thought I would have learned that lesson by now. Or, I don't know why I do this. I'm all the time getting in trouble with this, that, and the other. Well, none of us understand the plan of God, wouldn't you agree? And Paul is describing that our view of God, it's what we look like into an old mirror. It's dim. It's not the clearest of pictures, but we can see the love of God when we look at our own lives and the lives of others who we are accountable to. You want to see what God is doing in your life? Well, then examine your life. Examine your family, your friends. I tell you, there's nothing like seeing the Holy Spirit in your family when you look at them and go, ooh, I did that same thing when I was a kid. There's nothing like looking at your buddies when they mirror back to you the same thing you said and go, did I say that? That's not what I meant, is it? Well, I've got great news for you. Before you beat yourself up for not knowing everything you should know by now, the flawless understanding, this idea of unrestricted knowledge pertaining to God and the kingdom, it'll all come together when we meet Jesus. How do we know that? The Apostle John even confirms it in 1 John 3. He said everything will become clear when we see him face to face. Beloved, now we're children of God. It's not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we shall know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we'll see him as he is. Many of you can relate to misunderstandings. Whenever you receive a text message and you read this text message and you go, what did they mean by that? Or you get a text message and you go, I don't know if that was meant for me or not. You see, when you meet that person face to face and you turn the phone around, you go, what in the world are you talking about? Then you can see them eye to eye and they'll explain everything they meant. Well, and this is the really encouraging part. Because it's not always going to be a dim picture, one day we'll see Jesus face to face. Here's the truth. You can't see God and live. So when Jesus came to earth, for the first time they saw Jesus. I've never seen Jesus face to face. Hadn't done it. Any preacher that stands on stage and says, yeah, I've, I've seen Jesus. They're liars. But they have seen the things that Jesus has done. And they see Jesus in your life. Because it's the Holy Spirit that pours out. 
So then what do we do? If we see him in a mirror right now, dimly, but then face to face, what do we do? Our focus must be on Jesus. Along the way, we need to stay absolutely laser focused. And the more I spend with all these builders in our church, they have these little cool tools like strings that make everything straight. They have lasers that measure stuff. That ought to be my attention to detail. You know those home projects you have that require so much time and attention from you? What's your project like when it comes to Jesus since you're the project? In the meantime, until the Lord comes or till we reach heaven, you're going to have this limited understanding and knowledge. I'm asking that you don't beat yourself up completely just because you, you didn't know. But rather, you ought to challenge yourself to learn. It's the understanding that because this always won't be the case, this is our last transition in this scripture. I know many of you want to know God's will. Many of you are asking right now, well, if I can't know everything about God right now, then how do I know what His will is? Or how do I know that I'm right where I'm supposed to be? Well, let's make everything a little bit easier. This is what Paul says. Paul says that God will tell you through prayer and through His Word what directions, what steps to take. But for the moment, right now, let's concentrate on three things. Faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. See, nothing compares to the love that God gives you. Love is uniquely superior. Love is greater than faith and hope because faith and hope depend on love to exist. You see, without love, there is no true faith. A loveless faith is nothing but works. I got to do this and I got to do that. You ever met a loveless Christian? They don't exist. They're just mean people. I once had a teacher in school. The ironic thing is she was called Angel. She was quite a lady. At least I think she's dead. Why do I say that? In that process, she was mean for mean's sake. You ever met those people? That's what it's like to be without love. They can be the right doingest, right doing people. Did you like that? That was proper English. Did you enjoy that? But without love, they're just harsh. And so because Paul says that if I can have faith that moves mountains without love, I'm nothing. And so without love, there can be no genuine hope. A loveless hope. It's an oxymoron. How can you have hope in something you don't love? If you expect your family to be home at a certain time, but you don't believe them, there's no hope there. All it's filled is with doubt and uncertainty. A quality of life that is far removed from anything to do with love or without hope. You're just nothing. And so what Paul says is that you've probably heard many messages on faith. You've probably heard messages on hope. But as I wrap this up, this is my challenge of the love of God in your life. One of the reasons that the love is the greatest gift is this is essential to God's nature. Nobody else will give it but Him. Love is the core. And so do you call yourself loving? Are you a loving person? Do you love God with all your heart and your mind? The law of Christ is to love God and then love others. That's what Jesus taught us, is that we ought to love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. It's the first and greatest commandment. But then what happens? You're supposed to love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets, everything from the mouth to the hand, it's all written down with those two statements. Faith and hope, they'll benefit you. As your faith increases, it'll bless you. As your hope increases, it'll bless you. But you know what love does? Is it blesses others. Love is selfless. And so as I wrap up this chapter, isn't that good? We finished 1 Corinthians 13. Only took us 93 weeks to do it. That's, that's an exaggeration, of course. But here's the real challenge. I believe in my heart that every single one of us in this room now understand love. But there's a big difference between what goes on in here and what goes on in here. 
And so this morning, that's the real challenge. It starts with, are you born again? Do you have the love of God in your life? And then it moves on to maturity. It's time to grow up. It's time to examine how much love is in your life and how much love you're giving. And so this morning, we're going to sing a song. If you don't know who Jesus is, we want to invite you to come over here. I'm going to tell you all about how to receive the love of Jesus in your life. And for those of you who do know Jesus Christ, it's time to challenge you in your love. Are you growing? Are you loving others? And so as we sing, this altar is open. There's some games. I guess if you want to play some dominoes, you can. But no matter what you do, don't play around with the Lord. All of us are bound for eternity. I'm looking forward to mine. Are you? I'm looking forward to it because I'm going to meet the one face to face that I have said that I love with all my heart. Let's pray together. Lord, we love you. We really do. It's not just something we're saying. It's something that we want to experience. And so now, here and now, I'm asking that your love pour forth. I'm asking that your love change us from the inside out. And here and now, I ask that we're different. And I ask that in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Would you stand? Would you come? that perfect just turn your eyes on jesus so as you leave this place may god bless you i hope that you get rest today i hope you recover well today and if you need a little bit of energy we have a brand new coffee maker we'll just make you some okay and so enjoy this day that god has given and just turn your eyes on him let's pray together father thank you for loving us thank you for sending us your son and one day I know it's dim now, Lord, but one day when we see you face to face, you'll tell us all the things we need to know. And for that, we give you great thanksgiving. And we pray that in the name of Jesus. Amen.
Goodbye, everybody.